Good morning, everybody. Great to see you guys here this morning. If you would please stand with us. We're going to go through a rendition of Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious is that grace of the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Cause grace that draws us safe thus far, and grace will lead us. Been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun. We've no less days to sing God's grace than when we first begun. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. All right. <clears throat> now we're going to do at Calvary. <clears throat> do what? Yeah, it's a different rendition, too. Years I spent in vanity and pride Caring not my Lord was crucified Knowing not it was for me he died At Calvary By God's word at last my sin I learned and I trembled at the law I spurned Till my guilty soul imploring turned To Calvary There your mercy and your grace was free There your pardon multiplied to me There my burdened soul found liberty Calvary yeah. Now I've given Jesus everything Now I gladly know Him as my King Now my raptured soul can only sing Of Calvary yeah. There your mercy and your grace was free Your grace was free. 
morning. Thank the praise group for doing those songs. Appreciate them very much. Uh, well, this is our Memorial Day Sunday. We're going to uh, salute the ones or uh, give honor to the ones uh, that have uh, given their all today. And we're going to do it th at this time. Daryl, will you uh, come and present our flag and we'll... Uh, Yeah. <laughs> we do we'll say the pledge. This uh I'll please stand. Say the salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, well, I'm glad you're uh, here to worship with us today uh, and online. Uh, the ones to be in prayer for today, uh, Travis, Al and Linda, Roger and Merle, Buddy and Sharon, Mike and Donna, Martin and Anita, Nysong, Brenda, Dexter and Jack L in uh, the island of St. Vincent, uh, Andy, Evan, and Ken. We won't have a practice today since it is uh, Memorial Day weekend. Uh, praise group will not practice today. Get that, get that right uh, for the service today. Uh, we're going to have a couple of hymns, uh, then the special music, and we'll get up the pastor up here for good news. Uh, let's uh, please stand again <laughs> and uh, sing our first hymn. I love to tell a story, 572. Solid Rock 406. Thank you. 
the dark. I messed it up. In the dark of the midnight, have I oft hid my face while the storms howl above me and there's no hiding place? Mid the crash of the thunder, precious Lord, hear my cry, keep me safe till the storm passes by. Till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more, till the clouds roll forever from the sky. Hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of thy hand. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. Many times Satan whispers, there is no use to try, for there's no end of sorrow, there's no hope by and by. But I know thou art with me, and tomorrow I'll rise, where the storms never dark in the sky till the storm passes over till the thunder sounds no more till the clouds roll forever from the sky hold me fast let me stand in the hollow of thy hand keep me safe till the storm passes by when the long night has ended and the storms come no more let me stand in my presence on that bright peaceful shore in that land where the tempest never comes, Lord, may I dwell with Thee when the storm passes by. Till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more, till the clouds roll forever, from the sky hold me fast let me stand in the hollow of thy hand keep me safe till the storm passes by hold me fast let me stand in the hollow of thy hand Keep me safe till the storm passes by. Good morning. I'm certainly glad that you chose to worship with us today. Uh, on this Memorial Day weekend, and uh, you know, Memorial Day is a is a time to uh, to actually acknowledge those that gave all they had for our freedoms. And uh, I want to just make mention of a few things uh, as we do that. Uh, a lot of us don't realize how many people have died to ensure uh, the fact that we can come in here and and worship together and, and let me just say this to you it also gives freedom to other religions to worship here in america as well if they choose to do that or not to worship at all go fishing or whatever they want to do it gives you freedom okay uh, I, i'm just telling you there was people that died to give you that ability since 1775 to 2019 1,354,664 people gave all they had 
for your freedoms. One of the most bloody, bloody wars that we ever had was the Civil War. Uh, it was actually the one that, that the most people died to free those people who did not look like us. Okay, so I'm just telling you, it, it, it gives freedom to everybody. There was people that died throughout the world or throughout America. Eighty wars, eighty wars in America's history. I didn't know there was that many. I really did, but I looked that up, and that's that's how many it comes up to eighty. And so we're uh, thankful for those that served. Uh, we're thankful for those that continue to serve, and we're thankful for those that gave all that they had, and for those families that uh, also lost their loved ones uh, due to that. So again, we just want to recognize those our veterans that give us those rights. We have a children's church this morning. Okay, well, we're going to dismiss the children and let them go out of here. Huh? Okay, I, I, I thought somebody was sending me out, huh? I didn't know. There you go, my man. I like that. Make sure that offering is in here. Tell you what. Amen. That's good. Today I'm going to preach you a message. We're going to be in Ephesians 6. So if you want to find your way over there, we're going to, we're going to finish up Ephesians one of these days. I feel like uh, one of the more popular pastors in in. North Carolina right now is a man by the name of Stephen Davies, and he preached the book of Romans verse by verse. It took him five and a half years, and they have a they have a, a joke, a standing joke. If anybody comes in and says, "Turn to the book of Romans," the whole place falls out laughing, you know, because I mean, it took him so long to get through it. There's nothing you can say new about the book of Romans, but we're going to get through Ephesians eventually. If I, if I had to title the sermon, and I think that's probably a good idea, I don't always do that, but if I had to title this sermon this morning, it would be the truth that holds us together. The truth that holds us together. Uh, Mr. Ethan, I think you've got some uh, pictures back here. If you want to throw them up on the screen there, uh, one of them or two of them or whatever, uh, we'll look at those. But I want to... I want to read now because uh, we're talking about the armor of God. I want to start in verse 11, and we're going to read down to verse 14, and we're going to pick up verse 14, and we're going to talk about that. So if you would, let's go to verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And we, we talked about that the other week. That is the, the trickery. That is uh, the schemes. That is the plans of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual weakness in high places. And that shows the rank of, uh, and the organization of, of spiritual wickedness. Verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you might be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Verse 14, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. I want to pray and then we'll get started. Our Heavenly Father, Lord God, we want to thank you for this day. Father, we want to thank you for the gift of salvation that you saved me with and many others. And Father, we thank you for the freedoms that have been purchased through the blood of people that saw fit to fight for this country and the freedoms of this country. Lord, we ask that you help us never to forget those things. Father, we acknowledge the responsibility we have as Americans. We have freedoms that no other country has ever had. And Father, we thank you for that privilege and for that responsibility. We ask that you help us to hold it high. And Lord, one of those freedoms we have is the freedom to preach and to worship you today. And we want to thank you for that. I want to ask your help in that as we look at your word. And Father, as I acknowledge this morning, we are in a fight against spiritual wickedness, even at this very moment and in this very hour. 
So I ask that you help me this morning. I pray that you help the hearers this morning to put the things of this world out of their mind. And Father, to put their whole focus and concentration on your word and the preaching of your word and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Lord, for whatever will be done, we'll give you praise, honor, and glory. For it's in Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. One of the things, I, I just want to say this. I, I've been meaning to say this for several weeks. Uh, I read this or heard this. I don't even remember where, where it was recently. But you know how you, how you struggle praying? Have you ever? I know y'all know what I'm talking about. I mean, boy, you're going to sit down. You're going to spend. You got 30 minutes locked off to pray. Boy, you pray about everything you know. And, but as you're praying, what happens? You think about the car needs to be washed. He need to put gas in it too, I guess. I didn't buy such and such at the grocery store. I didn't do this, and I didn't do that, and this needs to be done. And, and I, is the wind blowing? Is that what I hear outside? It, uh, is the sun shining? Everything in the world comes up, don't it? And, and, you, and like I say, you had 30 minutes blocked off. And you get done, and you find out you, you hadn't even been 30 seconds. That's part of the battle we're in. This spiritual wickedness in high places, that's part of what's going on. We're in a spiritual warfare, folks. We are. And Satan, he is doing his absolute best to disarm us and to put us over to the side. Now this morning, we're going to look at the first piece of this armor. Now we're, we know that we're in this battle, this spiritual warfare. And every single aspect of our Christian life is being attacked by spiritual wickedness. Satan don't want you to do anything. There's no truce. There's no ceasefire. He's always bombarding us. He's always attacking us. I want to look at this verse here for a little bit and talk about it. In this, ver this verse, verse 14, there's three versions, three modern versions of Scripture that really, really give the, the force of what's being said here. So I'm going to read all three of them. So y'all just going to have to hear this verse three more times. This is verse 14 out of the ESV. Stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. The ASV, which is a wooden version, stand therefore having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And this is my favorite of the three, the ISV. Stand firm, Therefore, having fastened the belt of truth around your waist and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. This verse here in the King James kind of seems like it gets done for you. But in the Greek, it is not it gets done for you. You are being commanded to do it. So it is put on the, uh, the uh, belt of truth basically, the girdle of truth. Where's my picture at? Do you have that picture somewhere? All right, let's look at this thing. Let's talk about a Roman soldier. We have a picture. That's a belt. That's what the girdle looked like. That is a picture of the Roman soldier there and, and his armor that he has on. And if you look at it there, you can't really see it very well, but underneath that belt is a, is a skirt now, in, in ancient times, they wore robes, right? And what they would do is when they had to get out and do some work, they would gird themselves up. So they'd reach back here and they'd grab the back part of that robe and they'd pull it up here and they'd cinch it up in their girdle, in their waistband, in their belt. So it wouldn't get in their way. In a fight, in a, in a, a soldier, he had to wear armor and you can't really see it underneath there, but there's a little short tunic that comes down here, 
and they would grab it and they would pull it up and they would cinch it up in that belt. That way they could move freely and not be easily uh, taken out. Let me just uh, give you an example. In Roman wrestling, ancient Roman wrestling, they didn't wear no clothes. That way you could grab a hold of them. You see that with sumo wrestlers. They wear a girdle kind of thing. And if you ever watch two big old sumo wrestlers, they run off there and they hit each other. And the first thing they do is they grab the only thing they can grab. And they're trying, they're, if you ever took karate or martial arts, that's, that's what they teach you, to throw somebody down. You grab and you put them down. You, you, you're able to handle them. So this here is the idea. You're pulling it up so somebody can't get a hold of you. It don't, it don't get tangled up in your legs. And you put it up in the girdle of truth. Now one of the things I read about this, this belt, this, this girdle of truth, or this, this belt that they'd wear around them, is when you put that thing on, uh, it actually made the, the warrior feel like he was ready for action. Because that there was cinching him all up and he was tight and it would, it would help him to get fired up, ready to go. Now, uh, show us that picture again of the, of the, okay. Look at that armor real quick now. You got a helmet. You have a shield. You have a sword. Now, the sword there, I almost want to talk about for a little bit, but I won't yet. But the sword, the shield, and the helmet are three pieces of armor that you have to pick up and put on, or you have to pick up and carry with you. They're detachable. The rest of it, the breastplate of righteousness, the, the shoes and the girdle, pretty much when you put them on, they're there. You can sit down and have lunch, you know, whatever. You don't have to run over there and, in the corner and say, where's my helmet or where's my sword or whatever, you know. It's, it's there with you, okay? So this, this girdle, this belt, is a permanently affixed piece of armor, and it is the first one. So let's talk about it a little bit, okay? Now, we're, we're done with our pictures there. You, you know, y'all can do what you want to with it. Jesus, as well as Peter, and as well as Paul, they all use the same idea of girding up your loins. Jesus says in Luke chapter 12, verse 35, he says, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. And what he's saying is be ready for action. Gird yourself up, get ready for action. Okay, that's the same idea here. At the beginning of the 20th century, there was a huge movement to unify the Catholics and the Protestants. Can I tell you something this morning? Some of you are going to get upset with me, but that's okay. It'll be all right. We'll talk about it. We're not really Protestants. Did y'all know that? Most people don't realize that if you're a Baptist, you're not really a Protestant. Or if you're a Pentecostal, you're not a Protestant. Or even a Methodist, you're not a Protestant. People call us Protestants, and we attach that to us, but we never protested nothing. That's what Protestant means. It means to protest. So Protestants are Lutherans, Episcopalian, Presbyterian. That's why they carried most of the trappings of the, of the Catholic Church. They protested the Catholic Church the way they were doing things. They wanted to fix it. That's why they were called the Reformers. They wanted to reform the Catholic Church. We never protested nothing, okay? We're Baptists. They, they used to just take us and dip us in, in kerosene and light us on fire, and that, that, that's what they've done with us. Uh, <laughs> Y'all think I'm kidding, but I'm not. <laughs> All right? Uh, everybody was against us. But The Protestants and the Catholics at the turn, turn of the 20th century, they, there was a movement to unify them. And they wanted to bring, they said, that the, they said that, that the reformers had just took it way too far and they wanted to, they wanted to heal the, the gap between them, okay? And so there was this, this big movement and 
it was uh, let me give you what it was called it was called the international missionary conference in 1910 that was that was one of the things it was edinburgh's where it was at it was funny the catholics never attended they, they didn't they, they'd send uh advisors or observers that were unofficial but they never attended and there was this there was this push for everybody to give a little and I forget what the Pope's name was at the time, but the Pope said, we're not giving to them. Okay. He said, well, why are you talking about that for? Well, because it says to gird our loins with truth. Okay. And somehow or another, we get the idea that this is truthfulness instead of truth. Okay. And Martin Lloyd-Jones, talking about that very thing, he says this, and man, Martin Lloyd-Jones has got an eight-volume set on the book of Ephesians. Two chapters, or three chapters, just on this one verse. Okay, yeah. That's not including the chapter in another book on this verse, but that, that's just in that one book. This is what he says, the modern attitude in the church herself is almost exact opposite of this exhortation, this command in verse 14. The apostle says that the church is to function as a body and if we are to function successfully as an individual Christian, the first thing you have to do is to put on the truth about your loins so that it may bind you and band you together. And set your feet and then energize you. All right? And it's all about the truth. Okay? It's all about the truth. We're living in a world, oh man, we're living in a world today. Many of you struggle talking to your children and even maybe some kin folks because you come from a world where there was absolute truth. Here's truth. Two plus two equals four. My son went to NC State, $13,000 a year, just so he could learn that two plus two does not equal four. Y'all laughing, but I'm serious. High levels of two equal five. Low levels of two equal three. I said, we called that rounding up. Fractions, you know. <laughs> That's what we call that. But they're teaching our children that there's no absolute truth. All right? And that's why you're struggling because you say, well, this is truth. Well, no, that's truth for you in your day, but that's not truth today. Okay? And so we got to ask ourselves, is there truthfulness or is it truth? Because there's a difference. Truthfulness is we're just all loving each other and we're, well, that's true for you. But that's not quite what I want. Is there propositional truth? Or is truth subject to me? in my interpretation of truth. See, that, that is what they're teaching everybody now. Because, see, that makes a difference. If truth is that there's one man, one woman, make marriage. If truth is fornication is sex before marriage. If truth is abortion is murder, and that's what the Bible teaches, we were discussing somebody the other day, and I, I don't even remember who it was we was talking about. And I said, well, you know, if you take the nine months that they were alive in the womb, then they make it to 100 years old. You know what I'm saying? We don't think about it like that. We look at it as August 6th is Marty's birthday. Y'all remember that because that, you know, I'm expecting presents. And... <laughs> <laughs> Y'all like that. Everybody got a good one on that one. 
we see the the example of of somebody wanting to trust human armor versus God's armor. We see that with David and Saul. You remember that story? Saul says, "Well, I want to be a part of this. I want to have part of the. I want to have part of the success. So here, use my armor." David says, "I've never tried that." See, you say, "Well, that that don't make much sense." Look, that's what we want to do. David had David had said, "I am going to fight Goliath in the name of the Lord," and Saul said, "Let's fight him in the name of Israel." Let's fight him in the king's armor. Let's trust in the king's armor. David said, no, I want to trust in Jesus. I want to trust in God. And that's exactly what he done. Later on, at the very last chapter in Saul, uh, in, in uh, 1 Samuel, the very last chapter, we see Saul on the battlefield dead. He had trusted in his armor. The people came and stripped him of his armor. Cut his head off and left his body in the field. That's what happens to us in our life, folks, is we start trusting in our armor and not the armor of God. So let's see what happens here now. We, we, I, I've, I've read up this much. Let's, let's get to this thing. So we've got to answer the question, if it's not truthfulness, and it's truth, what is it? I want you to listen to something real quick. We sang a song a while ago, The Solid Rock. I asked them for that to be sung. And I want you to listen to the first refrain. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Now listen to this. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. What is the sweetest frame? My frame. I dare not trust my body. I dare not trust my own doing. I dare not trust my own reasoning. Jeremiah tells us in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 7, that the heart is deceitful and wicked above all things. Who can know it? That's me. I can't know my heart. You, do you know that? You can't know your heart. I know y'all don't believe that this morning, but you can't know your heart. You'll sit right there and say, well, I'm doing this for Jesus and in your heart, your heart's done tricked you that you're doing it for Jesus, but you're doing it for some other reason. Oh, me. Well, I done that over there for, you know, no, no. I done that so somebody would pat me on the back. I wanted somebody to recognize me. Right? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Your heart's wicked, and it's deceitful. It will deceive you. I can't trust my own frame. So again, what is truth? Pilate asked that question and Jesus answered it in John 17, 17. Now Pilate didn't hear the answer because he wasn't there in, in the garden with him. But I want you to listen to it, starting in verse 7. Now they have known all things whatsoever thou hast given me, that they are thee. For I have given unto them the words that thou gavest me, and they have received them. And have known surely that I came out of thee, and that they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them, listen to this, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all of mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in this world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep, uh, keep through thy own name those thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in my name. Those that thou gavest me, I kept. And none of them I lost, except for the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now I come to thee, and these I speak, uh, I speak in the world, that they might have my joy full, fulfilled in themselves. I have given them my word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. You need to remember that. I pray not that thou should take them out of the world, 
but that thou should keep them from the evil. That is actually the evil one. That they are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Jesus explained what truth was. Truth is God's word. We can sit here and talk about the truth of everybody under the sun. Spock's truth or or whoever. I, I, don't, I don't even know. I can't even come up with anybody's name right now. But we can say this is truth. Fox News truth. Uh, uh, MSNBC truth. Uh, this is Trump truth. This is Biden truth. This is whoever's truth. But I got news for you. Jesus said God's word is truth. That is what we are to put around our waist and get ready for battle. It will help us to understand what's going on around us. So now let's look at this thing. We'll, we're going to be real quick. There's gonna, I'm going to give you three things that truth does. Truth unifies. Truth unifies. See now, you don't have to believe truth. Okay, right? Would y'all agree with that? If I if I sit up here and I proclaim truth, I said this is what God says. You don't have to agree with what God says, right? I guarantee you, we can go uptown right now and we can find some churches where they're worshiping the same Jesus we are, and yet they go to the Word of God and they have found some place in there that they don't agree with. You want me? To, you want me to give you an example? Sure, y'all do. You ain't going to like it because it ain't popular today. Egalitarianism. What is egalitarianism? Well, that's basically women's lib. Now, I believe in equality for women. Don't you disagree with me on that? I'll argue for women's rights. I'll argue for them being equal in the workplace. But guess what? God says if a person wants to be a pastor, first requirement. What is the first requirement? Got to be the husband of one wife. That ain't by today's standards of marriage. That was husband of one wife. There's people right now, they, they, they hold in church right now, and they, they, they ignore that particular verse. Well, Marty, why do you want to talk about that? Truth unifies. If we say we're going to stand on God's word, then it will unify us. We'll know who needs to be pastors and who don't. Okay? We won't have to sit around and say, well, what do you think about it? I have that question all that. I love that. People come up to me and they'll say, well, what do you think about such and such? Well, it don't matter what I think about it. Let's see what the Scripture says about it. How's that? The very first time anybody ever asked me about that question, they asked me, it worked. What do you think about women preaching? I said, I'm glad you asked. Let's see what the Bible says. I don't care what I think. Let's go to 1 Timothy 3. Let's go to Titus. Let's go to 2 Timothy. All right? Oh, well, that's Paul. He, uh, no. Paul, listen to me now. Paul was writing with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit upon him. He wasn't writing his opinions. Okay. Truth unifies. Amos chapter 3, verse 3. Can two walk together except they be agreed? We've got to be agreed. And if we'll say we're going to, we're going to stand on truth, then we'll be in agreement. We just have to agree with God. We don't have to agree with each other. If we agree with God, then we'll be in agreement with each other. What do you think? How do you like that one? I, I love the fact, and I told you all this a couple of weeks ago, but my friend David, he, where he's pastoring it down here in didn't they, their, their church come off because of a, a, a liberal denomination their, their church came off of that they would not give them the building that they were in because the denomination owned it they come off of it they started their own church as they were working through their doctrinal statement they determined that there was two different groups of people in the congregation there was one group that was an Armenian and one group that was Calvinistic and so instead of being mad with each other, they just said, well, we need the Calvinistic ones. We need to go over here and start a church. And the Armenians need to go over here and start a church. And they love each other and they, they spent time with each other. They wasn't mad. 
But see, truth will unify. It will help us to walk together. Amen, Marty. Amen. Oh, me. I, I, could, I could bang on that drum too much. Truth directs. How many of you want some direction in your life? Man. I mean, everybody, everybody wants to get some direction in their life. I mean, most of you probably have forgot how to read a map. Daryl probably still remembers how to read a map because he used to have to read one all the time. But most of you probably forgot how to do it because of why? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, oh, turn here. <laughs> turn. Yeah, I, I know I'm lost without mine too, so I know what I'm talking about. Okay. But most of us would like to have a road map of life, direction, right? And truth will direct you. It'll direct you in the right place. Listen to Psalm 119, verses 103 through 107. How sweet are thy words unto my taste. Yea, sweeter than the honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I have sworn and I will perform it and I will keep thy righteous judgments. I am afflicted very much. Quicken me, O Lord, according to thy word. God's word is a lamp unto our path. It's a light unto our feet. It will guide us. If we will just take the time to read it and ask God to show us what we need to do. You know what we're usually doing? If you're like me, you already got it over there in the red line running all it'll do. Foot just on the floorboard like it was lead and say, Lord, give me some direction. Right? Ain't that the way we do life? We'd be a lot better off in life if we had stopped and say, Lord, I'm not going to move until you at least shine that light on my next step. Being in too big a hurry. Marty's in too big a hurry. Nita and I, we, we're working on something right now and trying to work on something. She's angry with me about something uh, and, and I'm trying to see if, what God would have me to do. And, whoo, she's like, you don't need to do nothing else. You just need to just kind of, but we're, we're waiting. We're, we're going to wait. We're going to see what God will do. Okay. And if, if God won't do it, then we just, just ain't going to do it. How's that? I'm going to wait on him. Wait on the Lord. There you go. And you'll be flying on what? Eagle's wings. Exactly right. But we don't want to wait on the Lord. We want to, we want to fly on, on Marty's strength and on your strength. And we want to do it our way. But I got news for you. God will give you direction if you allow him. He will. He'll show you who you need to marry. He'll show you where you need to work. He'll show you where you need to go to school. He'll show you sometimes you don't need to go to school. Woo. They, they some good jobs out there now with no school in it attached. They like that. No four-year degree. Go be a welder. My son said you can make $100,000 a year welding on the pipeline. I don't know about you, but I ain't making hundred thousand dollars a year. Maybe you are, but I, you know, and I like the weld. I just ain't no good at it. I know somebody that is, but I'm not. Truth unifies. Truth will direct. It'll direct this church. It'll direct your life. Truth will give assurance. Ephesians chapter one, verse eighteen, the very book that we're in. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. I'm going to tell you what, when you start looking at the word 
and you start reading what God has in store, one of the things that we're doing now, we're all trying to figure out who the Antichrist is, and we need to be looking at the Christ. How you like that one? I read this somewhere recently of one of my friends or somewhere, I don't know, but they said this. They said, we are never commanded to look for the Antichrist, but we are commanded to look for the coming of Christ. And I'm going to tell you, I told you all this before, when we've been going through Revelation and stuff, I'm not concerned who the Antichrist is. I tell you what, you wait around, you meet him, you shake his hand, when you get to heaven, you tell me all about him, okay? How <laughs> you like that? I'm going on up in the rapture, man. I'm going on up in the rapture. But we've got some, we've got some hope. We, what, what is hope? I know y'all know this because I tell you this all the time, but I'm going to tell you again. The word hope does not mean, I, I wish I win the lottery. I don't even have a lottery ticket. I've never had but one lottery ticket my whole entire life. And so I, I, I don't even have a ticket. So I'm not going to win the lottery, but you know, I, I, I hope I win the lottery. We well, gotta have a ticket for you to win anything, don't you? Right? Well, I sure do hope Duke wins this year. Well, they ain't going to. Okay. I sure hope Carolina gonna win this year. They ain't going to either. <laughs> okay. Right? We we got all these hope, these wishes, these wishes. That's not what the word hope is. The word hope means I have a joyful expectation based on something. Folks, we have a hope. We have a blessed hope, a joyful expectation based on God's word. God's word says, my hope is in Jesus Christ. I'm looking for his return. He's going to call me out of here before the tribulation period. He's going to look after me during this time. Somebody going to have to look after me. I was telling Brother Bill this morning, I said, I was looking at some green beans. My word, have you looked at what it costs to plant green beans this year? I'm going to buy stock in green beans, man. $11 for 100 green bean seeds. I planted what was left in a, in a bag that I had, and on that bag I bought from a local store. It said a half a pound, $3.50. A half a pound, there's a whole lot more than 100 beans in there, I'll tell you that right now. Uh, I don't, man, things are crazy, but I'm trusting in Christ, man. It gives assurance. Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, and the peace of God which passes all understanding. She'll keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. Listen to Colossians <coughs> chapter 2, verse 2. That their hearts might be comforted and knitted together in love and into all the riches and the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and the Father of Christ. Folks, the truth will give us assurance. Look. <coughs> I've got a little Nissan truck sitting out there in the parking lot. I'm pretty sure when I get out there and get in that truck and put the key in the ignition, it's going to crank. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure. It's done that for the last 20 years. I've had it for 20 years. And it's done it for 20 years. I'm pretty sure it will crank. Pretty sure. But when I read a promise in God's Word, I have more assurance. It's a guarantee if that promise belongs to me. We've got, to, we've got to gird our loins with truth. 
I'm talking about the truth of the Word of God. I'm not talking about anything you learn anywhere else but the truth in the Word of God. And when we put that there, it helps us to hold everything else together. That's why it is the first part of the armor it tells us to gird ourselves with is this right here. Put it on. Leave it on. Because everything else is held together by this particular thing. Folks, our church has got to stand on truth. We've got to run according to truth. I'm going to tell you it's not going to be popular in the days ahead. It's already not popular. But it's going to get a lot less popular. You better believe that. Okay? You stand on what God has to say, people ain't going to like it. And they're not going to like you. It's not a popularity contest. It is an obedience contest. I'm going to stand with God. It will, it will help us to be unified in our church. It will, it will give us direction in our life as well as our church, and it will give us assurance when things look like they are out of control like they do right now and like they have had for a long time. The world is skidding. The entire world is skidding. Not just America. The whole world. Aren't you glad this morning that you can go to the Word of God and say, I, I read that last chapter over there. Let, let, let me get over there and read that. I read that last that last chapter. And, and somehow or another, it don't seem like I lost. Let, let, let's see here. Verse 20. Chapter 22 of the book of Revelation, verse 20. He which testified these things says, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. But the last I read right there, we win. It just, it's dark right now. It don't look like that. So, church, we need to base our 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 whole being of what we do, what we practice on God's word, on his truth. But now, as an individual, you need to do the same. So you're sitting here this morning and you're looking at me and you got your Sunday smile on. Hadn't, hadn't even had a Christian discussion today. Y'all know what a Christian discussion is, don't you? That's when y'all fighting like cats and dogs coming up the road. <laughs> you get inside of the church and it's... Christian discussions when you have that disagreement as Christians. But you're sitting here this morning with your Sunday smile. First thing you need to ask yourself, are you a child of God this morning? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt Jesus Christ saved you? Because only then can you start putting on the armor of God. If you try to put on the truth without knowing Him as your Savior, truth will get too heavy. It'll be like Saul's armor trying to go on David. It won't fit. I beg you this morning, I beseech you this morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. It'll be the greatest decision you ever made. Oh, I wish I could tell you it's going to be all easy, but it's not. The greater is he that's in me in this world. He'll help me. And he'll help you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I want to thank you for this day. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to preach this morning. 
And Lord, there's so many things that we could talk about when it comes to truth in our world that we live in today. So many versions of it. But God, only your word is forever settled in heaven. Only your word is absolute truth with no error whatsoever. Father, help us as the church, help us as individual Christians to put on the truth, to know the truth, and to gird up the rest of the armor that we must stand with, with the truth of your word. Help us to know it better. Father, if there's somebody here or in the sound of my voice on the internet that has either turned their back on you, walking afar off, have laid down their weapons, or has never known Jesus Christ as their Savior, may today be the day that they come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And again, Lord, we'll give you the praise, honor, and glory for what you do. Yes, this is Jesus' name. Amen. Come as God leads you this way. This is Pastor Marty Granger here at Cedar Grove, and we just want to thank you for tuning in with us this Sunday uh, and spending your Sunday morning worshiping with us here. It means so very much to us as we see people tune in week after week. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, that if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Today, as we went through the service, as you worshiped with us, if you feel like God's dealing with your heart on the fact that you're not saved and you need to make a decision uh, for him. We'd love to help you in that process. It's a simple process. You just got to agree with God. And that is that you're a sinner and you're in need of a Savior. If you'll call upon him, he will save you. The Holy Spirit's dealt with your heart and you're a Christian and you need to make some decisions. We'd encourage you to do that as well. Now, again, we've enjoyed you being with us this Sunday and we look forward to worshiping with you again at the midweek and next Sunday as well. In the meantime, if you need to contact us, that information will be made available. May God richly bless you, and we look forward to seeing you at the next appointed time.